Fantastic to have you here today, Zoltan. Thank you for joining the show. Absolutely. Pleased to be here with you, Katie. I want to drive straight into the core topic. So I know you developed a framework around business development called the Launch Code. What are the fundamental pillars of this framework? So the Launch Code is, is sort of the outcome of, of 30 years of experience I've had uh, building businesses uh, in various capacities as a senior executive, as an entrepreneur, as an investor, and now as an advisor. And, and what it does is it encapsulates um, the process you follow in order to, to scale your sales on a global level. And what I mean by that is that it really takes you through kind of a three-step process or three-pillar process that helps you first to focus on the right things to create a clear offer and a clear message to your target customers. Then it introduces a kind of a systematic approach to selling to make sure you're generating enough leads um, from inbound, outbound, as well as from partnerships um, to, to be able to scale your business. And then finally, uh, it talks about execution, right? So how do you go from um, this sort of situation where you've got sort of all these concepts and, and, and principles and how do you apply those in a very operational way uh, by setting clear goals, uh, tracking your performance and ultimately building a team that can scale with you. And so that in itself is this business development framework that I call the Launch Code. Um, and it's something that I share with uh, business to business tech founders through personal mentoring programs, through workshops, and soon through an on-demand course as well. Amazing. I love the three pillars and the clarity of them. Where do you feel is often the bottleneck? Do you feel that it's more in focus and crafting a message in the sales and the systematic approach or in the execution and the goals? Do you feel it varies a lot or is there a bottleneck that shows up time and time again? Uh -huh. Well, interestingly, that the, the structure of the launch code is built on the back of the problems that I've discovered over my 30 years and specifically the last five years I've spent working with entrepreneurs and the, the key challenges they have to scaling their business. Broadly speaking, you know, there's three kind of things I think that a lot of entrepreneurs um, have to overcome in order to be able to build a sustainable, scalable business. First is to focus on absolute clarity when it comes to who they're selling to, what they're offering, and, and fundamentally why somebody should buy what they're selling, right? That, that in itself is a really critical part of the process. And I think that's where a lot of companies, um, especially early stage companies, uh, uh, got off on the wrong track. You know, uh, my saying is if you sell every, if you're, if you're everything to everybody, then you're nothing to nobody. And I think that's a really critical uh, insight to keep in mind. And so that's what actually that first pillar ha handles is it helps you create a really focused offer and a message. The second problem that, um, that a lot of entrepreneurs and startup founders that I work with uh, have is, you know, their sales structure is, uh, or sales system is based on the concept of, I know a guy, right? I know a guy at this and this company. I know a person at this and this uh, organization. I'll give him a call and we'll, you know, figure out how to do business. You know, that works for a certain period of time. And certainly at the beginning stages, when you're developing your business, it's important to have those personal connections because you can use those to really test a lot of the principles and the thoughts and things that you, you have at the beginning of stages, but that's not scalable, right? There's, there's a limit to how many people you can, first of all, there's a limit to how many people, you know, even the greatest networkers probably don't have more than 500 to a thousand people who have any meaningful, you know, uh, contact with their current business. Um, and the other thing is, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, to scale in the sense that you're always built building in the back of personal relationships. So you can't really build a team underneath you, to, to, to scale your, your, your sales. So, you know, that's what the second pillar is all about. It's like, how do you create a very systematic approach, a scalable sales model that builds, you know, how do you, when you reach out to potential customers at outbound sales, when you work through partners, um, which I think is a really important part of the, the sales scalability process. And finally, how do you attract inbound interest through various direct digital marketing and, and, and PR and events uh, activities. So, so that's the second piece. And then the third piece, again, addresses that core problem, which is, you know, startups and their best day are sort of controlled chaos, right? I mean, you got so many things you're doing, you got so many directions you're taking, and it's sometimes very difficult to find what it is you should be focusing your efforts on. And so what that does is, you know, what I've, what I've discovered is that, that in itself is a huge obstacle to growth. And so creating a very systematic, clear operating guidelines is what's going to help uh, um, startup founders and, and entrepreneurs to, to focus their efforts and their limited resources and times on the, the things that matter most. And that's what that, that is all about. So really all three problems I've just outlined are what basically the launch code provides a solution to. 
Mm, that makes sense. I mean, it's looking at all the sort of issues that entrepreneurs and startups struggle with and putting together a framework to help them with this. If we come back exactly. to the second pillar of sales and you would talk about a systematic approach to sales, could you share a bit more how entrepreneurs should go about and can go about having this systematic approach? Yeah, so so I would start with with the first um, element or module of, of, of sales, which is outbound sales. So there, um, you know, when you're, you're creating um, this systematic approach, uh, you have to develop what I call the customer acquisition process, right? You have to, first of all, identify who your ideal customer is. Then you have to basically figure out which companies um, meet those criteria for your ideal customer. Then you have to figure out who is it that that customer or that company who is a decision maker or an influencer in the decision. And then you have to figure out how you're going to get in front of this person, right? So, I mean, you have to go through those steps rather than kind of doing bits and pieces here and there. And so that sort of systematic approach starts with, you know, the end game in mind and then works back from there. Then it becomes a question of how do you reach out to them? How do you engage with them? What's the process of doing you know, a lot of that stuff? I think is it becomes maybe a little bit more naturally. So that's, that's one piece of the systematic approach. The second piece of the systematic approach of selling is partnerships. And I think this is one of those things that a lot of companies underestimate. You know, the biggest challenge that startups have is they don't have a lot of credibility and they don't have a lot of history, right? It's completely natural, right? They're young companies. And so if you can tap into the credibility and the history of another company to use them to your mutual benefit, obviously, to build your business, then that's a great way to, to, to create a business. And so systematically identifying who are the type of partners that you're going to work with. And again, partner is a very broad term, but broadly speaking, I talk about you know agents, people who are selling on your behalf, distributors who uh, will maybe distribute your product or service in a particular market uh, through their own service, you know, th their own channels. Um, you know, there could be marketing partners, organizations who aggregate your your target customers in one group. You know, typically business organizations are a great example of that, where you can reach them. They offer some value to their members. You get the benefit of access to those members. Uh, you know, there's all different strategies for partnerships, but the bottom line is you have to follow that same sort of structured approach. Where like, who do I want to speak to? Who's my ideal partner? Who's there? Who do I get? You know, how do I how do I find my way in? And this <clears throat> this concept of way in, by the way, is something I talk a lot about is that you know, uh, I'm actually not a very big believer in cold calling. You know, I know there's a big industry that's based on like, you know, I'll generate, you know, 50 meetings for you a day and, you know, you'll be able to have all these sales conversations. You know, that kind of spray and pray approach for me is not really sustainable or effective, especially for a business to business focused uh, service. And so I believe very much in trying to identify your target and then figuring out how do I get in front of this person so that I'm within their comfort zone, right? And so, you know, one of the things I talk a lot about in the launch code is like, you have, what is that hook? What's that? That's that. What's that hook that you have with that person? Is it you happen to be from the same country? I mean, obviously, you know, if you're in Sweden and you were happen to be Hungarian and, you know, you meet another Hungarian in Sweden, it's probably unusual, not as much relevant if you're in, in Hungary, obviously. Um, you know, university connections are very important, especially in the United States. Um, you know, are there mutual areas of interest? Um, are there mutual friends? Are there, you know, anything that kind of creates that that initial connection with somebody so that you can then have a conversation where you're not doing anything else. All you're asking them is to listen. And obviously, if you have a problem, if they have a problem and you have a solution to their problem, then they'll be happy to speak to you. But it's a breaking through that first wall, I think, is really, really important. And then finally, on the systematic uh, sort of approach, inbound marketing is really, really critical. Um, there's only so many people you can speak to, right? You've got to be able to generate inbound interest from potential customers. And so using, um, you know, first of all, defining what the messages you're going to get out there that are going to attract people, um, defining what digital marketing tools you're going to use. And, you know, there's so many, right? Social media and advertising and search engine optimization and, and uh, you know, just incredible number of things. You know, I've created kind of approach to how do you narrow that down to just a couple of things that really make sense for you. And then finally, PR and events, you know, I'm a big fan of, of uh, going to events, meeting people in person, engaging with them on, on site. Um, unfortunately, that's something that we've been able to do a lot of in the last couple of years, but still very important part of that. Everything I've just described is just, you know, the building blocks to a systematic approach to selling. And I've, I'm very pleased that I've been able to package this all in a way that really adds value to, to the type of customers I speak to, which are B2B tech startup founders. Yes, the structure you explain makes it sound so clear and concise. And I loved what you said about cold calling compared to building that trust and hook 
uh, because this is something that I did, but unintentionally. For example, I connected with someone on LinkedIn. He was kind of potential target oriented. And then I saw went to the same university and I just wrote about it. And then he became a client, right? But I wasn't systematic about it and using yeah. it regularly. But I thought, huh, that's interesting. Just the fact yeah. we went to the same uni created a link. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, look, look, it creates a comfort zone. People like to, you know, birds of a feather flock together, as they say, right? So people like to be associated with others who have a common, um, who have a common background. I'll give you a very specific example, um, somewhat related to acquisition of clients. I've got my own podcast. It's called Launch Stories. And I basically I speak to um, successful entrepreneurs who built global businesses. And so I actually... Um, one of my hobbies is I do Spartan races. Uh, these are these kind of obstacle course races that, um, that uh, you know, you go through, climb through mud and, you know, go through barbed wire and all this crazy stuff. Basically, that there's just fitness races or endurance races. And so um, I had posted on LinkedIn, um, I don't know, probably just a couple, six or seven weeks ago that I was preparing for my next race. It'll be in the end of April. And a friend of mine saw that and they, uh, they sent me notes, say, hey, that's really great. Um, did you know that uh, the founder of Spartan Race went to Cornell University, which is where I went as well? We all went to university together. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. I looked him up. Yeah, he graduated a couple of years before I did. And so literally on a whim, I, um, I just went down my computer and I, and I copied the, the link to my post um, that I was introducing this kind of Spartan Race ambition I had. And I said, hey, his name is Joe DeSena. I said, hey, Joe. Um, I just posted this, had some great re re feedback. Hey, it just turns out that we were, both were at Cornell at the same time. I guess we never met. I'd love to invite you to, um, to my uh, podcast. And, uh, and for those of you who don't know, Joe is actually a pretty big deal. He's got like three big New York Times bestseller books. Uh, Spartan Race is basically a company with, you know, they do 300 races in 40 countries. It's like a big thing, right? And literally he wrote back in about five minutes. Yeah, I'd love to. I just had a podcast with him. He just launched his own TV show on NBC in the US of the week before I, I or the week after I interviewed him. So it was kind of an interesting connection. And I'm 100% certain I would not have had that opportunity had we not had that link. And so, you know, that's kind of a good example of how you can use that to your, to your benefit. In, in, you it's know, in amazing. Business. It really is amazing. The birth of a feather flock together that it really creates that trust of that credibility so yeah. quickly especially even for people who already have a lot of other things going on. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Looking at the last pillar of your framework, which is also super interesting, and as I'm really into peak performance and high performance, <laughs> I'd be really curious to hear what are the main KPIs that you use to track business performance? Well, you know, the focus of my system is sales, marketing, and business development. So in that sense, it's really much driven by you know, uh, results that are linked to sales and marketing. Um, the, the KPIs that I think, um, you know, in any sales organization you have to track are, you know, first of all, how, how much money are you generating? How much of that money is recurring revenues on a monthly basis, which is a fundamental to any, any scalable business? Um, you know, what is your conversion rate from leads to deals? You know, how many people do you have to meet in order to generate a single uh, deal? Um, you know, how many meetings does it take? Um, what, um, you know, what, what is the average value of a customer over their lifetime? Um, you know, those are all sales related things. Marketing is much more about, you know, how do you attract people into your pipeline? Um, you know, how effective are you in terms of your advertising? How much do you have to spend in order to acquire a specific customer? Um, these are all pretty standardized metrics, right? I mean, if you just do a bit of search online, you'll find that these are pretty standard. So, so those are the metrics that I, that I track, or I, I certainly, as part of the launch code, I teach uh, and, and share with my my clients is that, you know, you have to you have to track it, but it's almost less about what you track, but just the thinking that goes behind it. Because, you know, one of the challenges that a lot of entrepreneurs have is again they work in controlled chaos. Um, most entrepreneurs are more uh, intuitive decision makers than empirical decision makers. And so they get in the habit of, of making gut, gut decisions, which I believe gets you so far. And of course, not every great decision in, in history was made based on some deep analysis. It was just, okay, well, it feels right. But broadly speaking, in order for a business to become scalable, you have to start seeing patterns emerge on which you base your business decisions. And, and what I teach is that you have to be able to get into the mindset of tracking your effectiveness over time and, and discovering this pattern so that ultimately you can use that information to make better, more informed decisions. You know, if you find that actually you have to meet 10 customers in order to close one, you know, 
not a great close rate, but at least you know that if you're missing five customers, you better have 50 you know, leads, right? It's just simple math. You have to have that kind of thinking there. And, and I think what, what a lot of entrepreneurs don't do is they don't kind of think of that from a systematic way, right? They think of it more as a, well, uh, you know, I know a guy, as I said before, but so, so having that mentality, tracking those decisions, using that as a way to, to make better informed decisions is critical to be able to scale your business. Because again, over time, you know, you know, gut feeling is not scalable. It's very, very difficult to do that. Yes, I can definitely relate. I think I'm highly uh, intuitively driven and not empirical, but I do have a background in engineering that helps me to have a bit more of a systematic and measuring right. perspective. I'm thinking um, as I'm listening to this, but maybe entrepreneurs and founders that, that are listening and they're thinking, okay, great. They, they understand that they have to see the patterns and, you know, have a more empirical approach to things. How can they get these leads? Because we spoke about outbind sales and reach out to people with the hook. But do you have a way or a system? Is it like people should message 10 people a day or they should focus more on the marketing? Because I find there's a lot of different uh, strategies in terms of getting leads for you know through social media or through DMs or email yeah. marketing. So which ones do you feel lead the best results? Well, look, I think I, I would say that if, if I was looking into lead generation is a from from outbound sales perspective i think there are two sources for that first you know i do generally believe that you have to identify who it is you want to meet right so it's not about like let me send out a, an email and see if it sticks it's more okay so who are the companies i want to work with who are they there you know so how do i get to that person so in that sense i think that you know if you identify your target list then you have to identify your way in and maybe that way in is you know uh, uh, you know somebody who connect you can connect you to that person so using email as a tool to basically say hey um, Joe and I were chatting and he suggested I get in touch because da, 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 you know, using that as a, as a link, I think is a great way to build leads and relationships, you know, from just using simple email. The other thing I would say is LinkedIn is a very powerful tool. Um, you know, LinkedIn is a way for you to reach out to people who aren't necessarily even within your direct network. The only thing I would caution there is that, and I'm, I'm sure you have this experience as well, Katie, I feel like I get emails, you know, a typical connection is, so-and-so, uh, you know, from whatever company, uh, they want to connect. I said, okay. And then immediately you get the sales message, right? Like it's already in the, in the connect request. That to me is a real turnoff because they're basically, you know, it's like somebody, you know, stopping you in the middle of the street and say, hey, I want to sell you something, right? So it's just, it's just, it's not the environment in which you generally want to, to, to receive that information. But if I'm, if somebody reaches out to me and they seem to be relevant in terms of original, in terms of interest or industry, we're in good. And over time, we exchange some messages, maybe he shares an article, maybe there's something. And then he says, hey, you know what I was thinking? There could be some interesting opportunities for her to work together. You're just much more open to that conversation. So my, my, uh, my suggestion is if you use LinkedIn as a sales tool, don't use it as a cold sales tool. Do, do it as a way to, to build your network um, and, and develop relationships over time, play the long game. And more importantly, build your network because once you start posting on LinkedIn, um, you know your first level connections are going to be seeing your content more often, and then again, they're going to see you. They're going to see what the content you write, the 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 the, the um, information you you usually talk about, and that again is going to create some familiarity. I mean, you know, when you reached out to me to 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 become part of this podcast, um, you know, obviously we connected on LinkedIn, and I started seeing some of your content, so I'm much more familiar with who you are now than I was prior to, to our being connected. And so I think, uh, um, you know, it's a great example of, you know, again, I don't feel like we're talking to somebody who I have no one, you know, background or information about because I mean, I've been seeing you in the last, whatever, four or six weeks in LinkedIn. So I know some of the things that you've, you've thought about and you, is are important to you. Yeah, such a valid point. And I know that I've definitely been guilty of not cold sales exactly, but trying to get people immediately on the phone. And I know when yeah. I began on LinkedIn, be like, connect. And then it was like, let's just have a chat. And it just didn't work because people don't know you. You don't have that credibility. And yeah. you wouldn't do the same if someone just connects with you. So it's definitely yeah. not yeah. a functional system. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, you know, but, you know, if you if you go to an event, for instance, and you meet somebody, you see that there's an event, then you connect and say, hey, we were both at this event. Let's stay in touch. There's nothing wrong with it. 10 days later, you're up back and say, hey, I was thinking we could maybe have a conversation. You know, you can build it again over time. You don't have to do everything, you know, that, that moment. Hmm. I know that for me, one of the, the struggles with that is I'm highly, highly extroverted. And when I'm in a room with people, I approach people and talk to them like that. And so when yeah. everything pivoted online, I just wanted to do the same. 
sales or no sales. I just want to be like, hey, we're connected. Let's have a talk. Yeah. And it took me a while to adapt from offline mode. You can just cross the room and talk to people to online mode. Okay, let's exchange a few messages. Let's comment on each yeah. other's posts and then suggest a call. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, the, the last two years has has rewritten a lot of the rules of business. And, and I'll be very honest with you, even for me, I mean, I've, I've been in, in senior sales and executive roles for literally 30 years, you know, the first 28 of which were based on personal relationships and, 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 and developing that relationship and meeting people with the coffee. Um, but, but you know, the world has changed. Uh, you know, people are, are moving much more behind this digital screen. And I'll give you a very specific example. I'm, I'm traveling to London tomorrow for the first time in three years. I used to travel there once a week per month for years. I actually lived there as well for the purposes of trying to understand what's going on in the UK market, maybe seeing if there are some opportunities for me to collaborate. It used to be that I could book five to six personal meetings a day when I was in London, right? Just like, you know, coffee, lunch, coffee, all that stuff. And literally I've had maybe three meetings a day and the other three or four that I would have personally tried to book, the response was, hey, I'd love to meet, let's do a Zoom. And it's just, it's actually quite frustrating, right? Because I'm actually taking the initiative to travel to the city to be there in person, but about half the people that I want to meet with just say, well, let's do a Zoom, right? And so that's it, it's such an interesting shift in mentality um, that we've experienced is that, you know, the that that sort of... Um, that, that point where you, you know, the point at which you, you go into a personal meeting has become such, such a, you know, there's such a higher obstacle to overcome just because it's so much easier to do it online. And so that's, that's going to take, going to take some getting used to, I think, for a lot of people, um, especially those of us who have been in business for decades before this whole coronavirus thing hit. And, you know, that's what we were used to. Mm, for sure. So yeah, there definitely is transition and it is a, a different world in general, for sure. But it's interesting to learn, how to communicate, you know, offline, that's one thing, networking, events, speaking at events, and then online is also a whole other ball game. So that's where your framework is also super important in terms of systematic approach yeah. to sales and outbound and the inbound, uh, also through the content and the social media. What's your number one or most important lesson that you felt that you learned while you were developing this framework? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, it's an interesting process when you develop something like this. Um, you start out with a theory. You have some ideas about what this could be like. Um, you put it together and then you start using it in practice. And then it's interesting, two things happen. First of all, when you have to explain something to somebody else, it forces you to actually think through the details, right? So you actually have to go through the process and you realize, well, actually, a lot of the stuff, which for me was intuitive, I've got to put into words that people can understand in a very basic level, right? So that's one of the things is you learn to present and package the information in a way that's easy for others to understand. The, the second is not everything that you think is important at the beginning actually is important at the end. And so, um, you know, because I've got a, you know, a pretty senior management background as well, I, you know, I was in the business of, in some cases, I, I had a company of a thousand people I was managing. So a lot of my thinking was very broad, you know, um, organizational de development based. And what I realized is at the end of the day, you know, a lot of these companies are not at the stage where they're thinking about organizational development. They just want to sell stuff and sell more of it to more people, right? So I had to focus in my own efforts at making this much more about like, how do you add three to five new clients to your business every month? You know, that's my promise. And you do it by focusing, by systematically selling, and by organizing your sales in a structured way. And so that's where the focus of the launch code has gone. But it took me, you know, about two years to get there. Obviously, there were different stages. And, and I always laugh every time I think I'm like, I'm done with it. Then I realize, actually, I'm not done with it because I got another version. I think I'm at about 4.0 right now. Um, but, but actually what I've now realized is that I have reached after two years, uh, which is where I've been actively using this. I have now reached a stage where I can actually convert it into an on-demand course and it's got enough, uh, content and all the tools and worksheets and all of the supplementary stuff that you need to make this, you know, more marketable product. I now have got it complete and I can, I can stand behind and say, this is actually good. I'm a hundred percent certain that it will not be the same in a year, but it probably won't be as big of an adjustment as it was like the previous two years. So my lesson that I learned from this is um, you have to be very patient. You have to be very, um, you have to test a lot of this stuff out in the real world. 
um, in the same way that a startup, right? They come up with a product, they've got to iterate it, they get feedback, you know, it's, it's a lot of this stuff. And you just have to be prepared to make those changes, not fall in love with your ideas from the past so that you can open up opportunities for the future. And, and that's what I've tried to do with, with this uh, whole system that I've created. Amazing, beautifully put. So not being too attached to the first thing you come up with and be willing and able to make the modification, the changes necessary to make it a more useful or a more, yeah. Absolutely, Absolutely. and respond to the customer, right? I mean, at the end of the day, this is about what does the customer want and that's what you need to be able to package and, and present. Um, it can't be something that you've just got in your head and it's got to work that way. Yeah, absolutely. 200%. Anyway, we covered so much. I feel this is a perfect point to cut the podcast. We went through your whole pillars and we went more in depth into the sales and we talked about lead generation. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Dalton. I feel it was hugely valuable and we packed in so much information in half an hour. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak and, uh, and I hope you'll, uh, you and your listeners, listeners will find this uh, useful to help support the scaling of their own uh, business to business uh, companies. Amazing. Thank you.